Well, Father, we thank you for today and how rich it is already been. Lord, whenever we can gather together in your name and worship you, it is a good day. And now, Lord, uh, we get to hear what you have to say to us in response to our words of declaration and proclamation unto you. So we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Philippians, chapter 1. If you're new to church in the Bible, Philippians is in your New Testament. It is after the Gospels and Acts, Romans, Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, right before the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Well, if you are visiting with us, uh, last week we began a study out of the book of Philippians. And we saw that this uh, book, this epistle, is oftentimes referred to by commentators as the epistle of joy. And that's because the word rejoice, or the word joy, is mentioned almost 20 times in just four short chapters. And so it's just filled with exhortations to rejoice and to be filled with the joy of the Lord. And uh, we saw that uh, another theme is really the all-sufficiency of Christ and how when we come to that place of understanding his sovereignty and understanding that he is all sufficient to meet all of our needs, our lives are met and they are filled with joy. And we uh, shared last week that this uh, short epistle can really be broken down into four sections, each chapter covering a section. The first section is that we saw that we experience joy when we have a single focused life. And so when we are singly focused in on the Lord, that gives birth to his joy in our lives. In chapter 2, we saw that we experience joy when we have a surrendered life, when we give our lives over to him. That is really where true fulfillment and true joy exists. Then we shared that in chapter 3, we experience joy when we live a spiritual life, when, we're, when our lives are not about the things of this world, but rather they're about the things of God. And then finally, in chapter 4, we experience joy when uh, we have a settled or a secure life in Christ. And so uh, those are the four sections, basically, that this book is divided up into. And last week, we talked about this singly focused life. And we talked about how the kingdom of God flows out of relationships. Paul talked about how he remembered the Philippians and how he, he uh, really had a love that abounded uh, for them more and more, how he longed for them in his, his heart. And we, we talked about how God's kingdom truly does flow out of relationships. We also talked about how Paul exhorted us to have our love abound more and more in real knowledge and discernment. And so we discovered something very, very important about love, something that we really need to know and take heart of in this present day, and that is this. Love cannot exist in a vacuum. In other words, love needs guidance. And uh, Paul tells us that on one side it needs uh, knowledge or truth to guide it, and then on the other side it needs discernment to guide it. And we talked about how it needs knowledge or truth because knowledge and truth teaches us why we should love, why we should love God, why we should love others, why we should love ourselves. And so God doesn't want us to be ignorant of those things. There are strategic, profound, important reasons why God has called us to a life of love. Love does not exist in a vacuum. And then discernment shows us how 
we are to love. Knowledge teaches us why, discernment shows us how. And so without the guidance of the why and the how, our love can oftentimes be misguided, miscommunicated, and mistaken. And so as we seek to abound in love, it must be under God's definition, you see, and also God's direction. Otherwise, we must, might miss out on truly reflecting God's love to the world and reflect a love that really wasn't born of heaven. Now, it's here in the last half of chapter 1, which we will be looking at this morning, that we see Paul emphasizing once again this single focused life. And he does so very uh, powerfully and very profoundly in verse 21. And so let's uh, pick up in our study there in verse 21. Paul says this. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it's here that we discover that our life should have a single focus and Paul uh, describes what that single focus should be and that is for me to live is Christ. Could you say that out loud with me? For me to live is Christ. You see, that's our anthem as followers of Christ. He is our source. He is our strength. He is our shelter. He is our substance. He is our security. He is our song. He is our salvation. He is our all in all. He is the reason we uh, live and we move and we have our being. And so Paul just lays down the gauntlet. And he says, let's make it very clear. Let's, let's not have any misunderstanding in regard to what a single focus life means. A single focus life means for me to live is Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse 22 through verse 26. And let's read these verses as well. He says, but if I am to live in the flesh, that is this earthly body, this, this tent of flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, I'm not just going to waste my time here on earth waiting for Jesus to come and just sing the sweet hallelujah by and by in the sky until he does. He says, I, I'm, I'm going to make something of my life in the grace of God. My life is going to bear fruit for God's kingdom. And I do not know which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. In other words, my being here is going to benefit you. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress, and here it is, and your joy in the faith. There's that word. So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. And so here, Paul, he, he really pauses for a moment and, and he begins to reflect upon heaven. It's really something if you read through his uh, epistles, his letters to the churches, he, he mentions heaven and eternity quite a bit. It was always uh, in his heart. It was always in his mind. And, you know, when, when I think about this type of mindset, I, I really actually think of my wife, Linda. For as long as we have been married, she, she's always talking about heaven. She's always talking about longing to be in heaven and to be in the presence of the Lord. Now, I don't know if that's directly related to the fact that she's married to me. You know, uh, you know take me now, Lord. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. You know, uh, or, if... if uh, it is just that sincere desire to be in the presence of God. Because early on in life, she realized that this world doesn't have a whole lot to offer us. And you know, the longer I live, the older I get, I, I agree with her. And the less 
and less appealing this world becomes. Have you found that to be true? You know, Scripture tells us that in the last days that dark and perilous times will come. And as you look out upon this world today, it is filled with darkness. It is filled with corruption. It is filled with wickedness and sickness and wars and, and ad infinite anything you want in this world that is wrong is there. And so we discover here a fact that uh, we would all do well to really embrace and know and understand when it comes to living our lives for Christ and really what uh, it means to be a Christian, and it's this. We are just pilgrims passing through. We are just pilgrims here. This isn't our home. And so enjoy it while you can and enjoy it if you can, but let's not get too attracted and too attached to this place. Speaking of Abraham, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10 says this. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Here it is. For he was looking forward to the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. You see, just like Paul, Abraham was looking forward. Abraham was heavenly minded. He lived his life for eternity. And we have to ask ourselves on a daily basis, why am I here? What am I living for? Am I living my life for eternity? We, we sing that hymn. I think we're going to close it at this morning. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And so may we to be a forward looking people. And that's what Paul, he's just kind of taking this pause and saying, man, it would really be cool to be in heaven. It'd really be cool to escape all this nonsense and darkness and just be in the goodness and the glory of God. But I realize that if I hang around a little bit longer, it might benefit some people. And so I've resolved myself and I'm going to stick around. And then he goes on in verse 27 to the end of the chapter. And he shares with us really some uh, encouragements and exhortations in regard to how we can live this single focused life. How we can uh, truly live out that anthem of for me to live is Christ. And so he does so in verse 27 when he tells us that we in order to live for Christ, must stand firm. Look with me in verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain silent, I will hear, here it is, I will hear that you are standing firm. Standing firm. We sing the great hymn on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You see, loved ones, if your faith isn't firm, it is either flimsy, faltering, or fainting. And Paul is telling us here that a firm faith, standing firm, is essential to a single focused life where we are consumed with and we are living for the person of Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ. It is a firm declaration of resolve that Paul had made. We have to stand firm. This word firm, it, mean, it, it actually speaks of perseverance, of hanging on. The word stand, it means to remain or to abide or to continue in a similar path. And the thought here is this. Paul is saying, hey, keep on keeping on. Stand your ground. Be firm in your faith. 
and remain steadfast in your relationship with God. That's the only way that you are truly going to be able to say, for me, to live is Christ. Number two, the way we live a single-focused life and the way that we can uh, make that declaration that for me to live is Christ is he also tells us in verse 27 to seek unity. Look again in verse 27 with me, the latter part. He says, I will hear of you that you are standing firm. How do we stand firm? In one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, I was thinking about this and how the body of Christ is truly an amazing, diverse organism. From the way that churches are led to how we worship, to teaching and preaching styles, to philosophy of ministry, to various doctrinal issues, the multiplicity of personalities and traditions and church history. Listen, no two churches are the same. We are truly a mosaic of God's manifold and multifaceted grace. And yet Paul exhorts us that even in light of this truth, he says, we are, listen, we are to seek unity in the midst of our diversity. Seek unity in the midst of our diversity. And his exhortation is very clear. It's this. Focus and fight for our common faith in the gospel. That's what he's saying. Standing for focusing and fighting for our common faith. You see, this is important, what Paul is saying here, because doctrine alone will seldom unite us, but that is usually the litmus test that we use when it comes to, to unity, meaning this. Does this Christian believe what I believe about predestination? Do they believe what I believe about the gifts of the Spirit or women's role in leadership? or church government, or how we worship, or how we baptize, and the list goes on and on. But you see, those things are the wrong things, loved ones, to base unity and fellowship around. Those things are just icing on the cake, but they're not the cake. But you see, the gospel that Paul talks about here, the good news should always, always unite us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And that, that's why Paul says striving together, not for the doctrine of the church. He says striving together for the faith of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Simply put, listen, true unity can only be found at the foot of the cross. And if you try to find it any place else in the church, you're going to miss it. And therefore, that is what we should fight for. And that is what we should focus on is the gospel that Jesus Christ came to earth. And he was a perfect sacrifice. He died the perfect death. And he rose on the third day. And he's going to return. And if we believe in him and place our faith in him, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the gospel that we should focus on. That's the gospel that truly brings us together, not whether or not we should have red carpet or blue carpet or green carpet. And so he makes it very clear that our, our place of unity is Christocentric. Christ-centered, gospel-centered, you see. Then he goes on in verse 28, and he tells us the third thing that we must do in order to have a single-focused life and to be able to proclaim for me to live is Christ. And that is, he exhorts us here to stay in a place of peace. Stay in a place of peace. Verse 28, and in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. In other words, don't mess with God's people. But of salvation for you, and that too, from God. And so notice this exhortation that Paul gives the Philippian believers. He says, don't let your opponents alarm you. And so here's the deal. 
There are many enemies of the cross and those who embrace the message of the cross. And the fact of the matter is that they are growing by the day. Now, most of them are unseen. That is, they're spiritual in nature. They are demonic forces of darkness in spiritual places. But there are also others that are seen. In other words, they are physical in nature, and it's these physical opponents or enemies that is growing day by day. As a matter of fact, you may remember that Paul himself was once an enemy of the cross, and he personally sought to persecute the people of God. You might remember that he actually held the cloaks of the, of the men who stoned Stephen to death. He personally arrested and threw Christians in prison simply because they were believers in Christ. And while he was a Pharisee, make no mistake about it, Paul was an enemy of the cross. Paul was an enemy of the church, and he uh, sought to oppose it. He was one of those opponents. He sought to oppose it at every turn. And so he says, don't, don't be alarmed. And this word alarmed, it, it, it's a pretty awesome word. It means to be terrified or frightened, but it's a picture word. And the picture word is this. It's a picture word of an uncontrollable stampede of frightened forces. And so let that get into your mind. An uncontrollable stampede of frightened forces. Horses. That's the picture word of this word, alarm. And you know, I was thinking about this, that just like a stampede of frightened horses, sometimes our fears can just take off and run wild when we fail to enter into God's rest and God's peace. And I think that many of us have experienced that fear from time to time. It's a sudden fear that grips you and comes upon you, and it just takes off. The word opponents, it means to oppose, to lie in wait, to be against. The King James Version uses the, the word adversaries. And Paul is telling the Philippians that there's a place of peace in the eye of the storm. And it's there that we can find rest and we can find solace, even as our enemies seek to devour us and destroy us. And you know, this reminds me of God's promise to us in Psalm chapter 91. This psalm has been uh, <clears throat> such a healing balm and source of encouragement to me over these past uh, two or three months. I, I, I read it all the time. I pray through this psalm on a number of occasions. And I really believe that uh, this, this psalm for some of you here uh, this morning, it is going to be a prophetic word of healing and solace to you. And I want to encourage you, I'm just going to read through this. It's only 15 or 16 verses. I'm going to read through this, and I want to encourage you to just allow it to sink into your spirit. Allow it to warm your heart. Allow it to encourage your soul. And you might even want to just close your eyes. Don't fall asleep. I know that's easy to do when I speak. But just close your eyes and allow these words to sink into your spirit. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. 
For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. How powerful. How powerful a word. How powerful a promise of God to his children. And I have to wonder, you know, he says, don't, don't be alarmed or terrified, Paul said. I have to wonder if uh, Paul was not thinking of Psalm 91 when he penned these words to the Philippians when he talked about terror by night and arrows that fly by day. And so I want to encourage you, let God's promise out of Psalm 91 guard your heart and your mind today and every day of your life. Paul says, listen, if you're going to live for Christ, you have to stay in a place of peace. You cannot let your opponents, you cannot let the enemy terrorize you and overcome you and overwhelm you. You can't live for Christ that way. And then the fourth and the final word of exhortation in regard to sing, uh, living a single focused life and being able to declare for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Number four is we must suffer well. Suffer well. Look with me in verse 29 and 30 <coughs> of Philippians chapter 1. He says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, here it is, but also to suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Twice he uses the phrase for Christ's sake. And so here he's encouraging them to live for Christ means that we must suffer well in this world. Now some suffering in life is non-discriminatory and it's the result of our fallen nature. In other words, there is a suffering that is common to all mankind. It affects the entire world and everyone in it. No one can escape. These are things like that in our humanity we all experience from time to time. Sickness, death, taxes is something that we can relate to around this, this point in time. But beyond that, what Paul is teaching us here is that there is a suffering that is common only to believers in Christ. And so for the Christian, suffering as a Christian is also a universal experience, but it's not totally random like the suffering that happens in the world. But rather, it is a intentional suffering that comes upon us for Christ's sake. And that is what Paul is speaking of here. It's what I like to call sanctified suffering because it is for the sake of Christ, you see, that we endure these things. And we read about it in the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And so this is a common suffering that we as believers experience. Next uh, passage, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Let's read this out loud. Let's begin. 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And, and what Paul is saying here in Philippians and Corinthians, and what Peter is saying here in 1 Peter, is that there is a sanctified suffering which is intended to give birth to something important both in and through your life. God, listen, God does not waste anything. And that includes your sufferings. That includes your hardships, your difficulties, your tests, your trials, your tribulations. God is not a God of waste. He never wastes anything. He always is using things for his glory and for his purpose. And so notice that we see the fruit of this kind of suffering that Peter mentions in his epistle. Verse 13, we see the fruit of joy. Are we going to read this again? Okay, let's read this. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. My, my apologies. Let's begin. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So notice, in, back in verse 13, Peter talks about the fruit of joy in our suffering. Here in verse 14, we discover the fruit of blessing. And in verse 14 and 16, we read about the fruit of glory. Joy, blessing, glory comes from and out of this sanctified suffering that God calls us all to go through and endure. And you know what? We all seek joy, don't we? We all desire blessing. We all desire God to be glorified in our lives, but we want him to do it apart from this suffering we have. Right? It is kind of like our prayer, God, give me patience. And I want it right now. <laughs> you know, we want the patience without going through the process. And so it's very difficult in our finite and in our fleshly existence to understand the role that suffering plays from an eternal perspective. And the role that suffering plays in our development of becoming more like Christ, who Isaiah, by the way, says, was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Jesus knew uh, suffering all too well. And believe me, when I teach on this, I do so reluctantly because I'm no different from you. Listen, I hate suffering. Can I hear an amen? amen. I'm a wimp, just like you're a wimp. We're all wimps when it comes to suffering. But you know, the fact of the matter is that it is the hardships and sufferings that I have gone through that have made me who I am today. Listen, God has used my failures and my sufferings more so than anything else in life to form and fashion me. And I suspect that the same thing is true of you. And there's a really profound verse that I came across the other day. I shared it with some dear friends of mine. It's out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 21. And it says this. So the people stood at a distance <clears throat> while Moses approached the thick darkness, the dark cloud. Here it is, where God was. The thick darkness where God was, King James Version. And most of us, like the children of Israel, we prefer to stand at a distance when it comes to suffering and 
experiencing dark times in our lives. We would rather watch somebody else enter into the thick darkness, wouldn't we? And we'll just observe it from a distance, from a safe place, you see. But Moses was altogether different. Moses, the man of God, realized that God could actually be found by embracing the darkness. That it was there in the thick darkness where God was. It was there in the thick darkness that he met with God. And loved ones, it is there in the thick darkness that we too meet God in unexpected ways. And we have the privilege of sharing in the sufferings of Christ that will give birth somehow, some way to joy and to blessing and to glory. And so as we seek to live this single focused life where we can truly declare for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, Paul exhorts us. In order for this to happen, you must stand firm. You must seek unity. You must stay in a place of peace. And you must suffer well. <clears throat> and really, the first three are the key to the suffering well heart, by the way. Standing firm in the middle of the storm is paramount if we are going to get through trials and tests and tribulations. Jesus said, build your house upon the rock. You see, you cannot stand firm in sinking and shifting sand. It's impossible. Standing firm is directly related and dependent upon the foundation that you are standing upon. And so our foundation has to be Christ and Christ alone for me to live. Seeking unity is paramount because we need our brothers and sisters to stand with us when suffering comes our way, and our way it will come. Make no mistake about it. You see, doing suffering alone is a recipe for disaster. There is a strength in numbers that we need to draw from, and we are wise to surround ourselves with godly people when ungodly forces come our way. And then staying in this place of peace is paramount because, listen, hear this. This is a word for somebody today. Fear only feeds suffering's misery. Again, fear only feeds suffering's misery. And so we can never, ever, ever let fear be a companion to suffering because fear multiplies and magnifies suffering's sorrows. But you see, peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that guards our hearts and our minds, as we will read about later, it's something that transcends the pain. And it places us in what I like to call the God zone. Have you ever been in that God zone, that eye of the storm that serves as a buffer and enables us to face that suffering with faith and with order? For me to live is Christ. That is our anthem. That is our song. And to do so, we must stand firm in this world, in this culture that opposes us. We must Seek unity. We must stay together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't look for reasons that divide us. Look for reasons that unite us. And the greatest reason is always at the foot of the cross. Stay in that place of peace. Don't let fear, like a wild stampede of horses, just run away with you in your thoughts and your emotions. And suffer well. Suffer well, realizing that in it and through it comes joy, comes blessing, comes glory. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> let's close in this prayer. Let's pray this out loud, shall we? Let's begin. Father God, we declare along the thought that for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. We declare that this world is not our home and that we are just pilgrims passing through. 
We long to hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. As we live for you in this dark and lost world, help us to stand firm in our faith. Help us to walk in unity even in the midst of our diversity. Help us to seek your peace, never being alarmed at the fierce opposition that seeks to destroy our faith. And help us to suffer well, never despising the fellowship of your sufferings, and grant us the privilege of seeing and experiencing the joy, blessing, and glory that your word promises. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the uh, prayer team to come forward, the elders to come forward. If you need prayer this morning, I want to encourage you to come. Maybe you've had some problems standing firm, walking in unity, uh, securing the peace of God in your heart and your mind, suffering well. You don't do well like me, you suffer. Come and be prayed with, to be prayed for. And I want to encourage you, if you've never given your life to God, this is a perfect time to do it. That you're surrounded by a group of people that should that decision be yours this morning, they'll say, yes, God. They'll say, yeah. They'll say, good, good decision. You'll never find more support than you'll find this morning in this place, on this day. But you have to make that decision for me to live as Christ. I'm no longer going to live for myself, my ways, my understanding, my thing. I'm going to take that and place it at the foot of the cross. And I'm going to declare, Jesus, you're God and I'm not. And I accept your work upon the cross. I place my faith in you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. To fill me up with your Holy Spirit. That I might be born again. So that you might give me a future and a hope. It's really that simple. Faith alone, grace alone. Christ alone. Not by works, lest any man should love you. God bless you so much. He loves you. He's for you. He's with you all the way to the end. Amen? Amen.